Bitcoin, 42,000 is at a pretty important level that should, like low 40 should hold. I am quite confident that next year, we will be hitting records, all time records, in terms of mobility bookings. We think we'll be number two for some time to come in the US and obviously aiming for number one. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London and here is what's coming up on today's programme. It is Fed Day. A Powell hawkish tilt and a faster taper look all but certain. The ECB and other major central banks decide this week. Omicron may evade Sinovac. A study says it doesn't provide sufficient antibodies. The WHO is concerned that the new variant is being dismissed as mild. And Boris Johnson suffers his biggest rebellion since taking office, but manages to pass his new COVID rules. UK inflation surges to its highest level in over a decade. Let's check in then on how the markets are faring after a sell-off stateside, the Nasdaq lower on mega cap big tech names. And a handoff from Asia as well. Concerns about the data out of China, the slowing recovery, and of course a continued drag from the property sector. But the handoff over to Europe, what you've seen is some modest optimism, of course, as investors look ahead to that Fed decision. Gains of five tenths of a percent across the benchmark. We just want to highlight some individual factors that are playing out in these markets. It's technology that is at the top of the list in terms of your sectors here in Europe. Gains of one and a half percent. You still, of course, have the US 10 year yield comfortably below that 1.5 but it was inflation out of the US, that PPI number, almost 10% that caused concerns and a sell-off in technology stateside. That hasn't really been reflected in what we're seeing here in Europe. The pound is stronger, the highest level that we've seen since about December 7th. On the back of that inflation data, again, at a decade high, above 5%, gains of three-tenths of a percent for sterling at 132. Maybe some bets that the BOE will pivot to a more hawkish stance at its meeting on Thursday. It's touch and go, really, as to whether they decide to hike rates or hold off into the new year. A difficult balancing act for the Central Bank of the UK. Cineworld is a stock that's in focus for us today. Losses of more than 25% after a court in Canada ruled that they'll have to pay close to a billion dollars for Cineplex, which is a chain of cinemas in Canada, after the court ruled that they broke and a breach of a contract after they had planned to buy and then they walked that back six months later. So pressure on that stock. In terms of how things are pairing out across the European space, you're seeing divergence. Basic resources is a drag on the UK markets. That's linked to what's happening in China in terms of the softer data, the recovery slowing and continuing to slow in China and the response from policymakers in focus down two tenths of a percent, again, largely as a result of basic resources, but also concerns about inflation. The CAC is the standout in terms of the major benchmarks across Europe. Gains of seven tenths of a percent. The DAX gaining four tenths of a percent, and the IBEX is lower. Inditex dragging that index into uh, down three tenths of a percent. Let's switch focus then to the Federal Reserve. It is widely expected to announce a doubling of the pace of its taper later today. That is according to Anna Wong, chief U.S. economist for Bloomberg Economics. But the question dividing analysts is this: Does an accelerating taper mean a faster and steeper path? of interest rate hikes. Now with us is Annika Treon to discuss this question. Van Lanschot Kempen, head of Competence Center, and Eddie van der Volt, Eddie van der Volt from our M Live Markets Live team as well, of course. Uh, let, let's, let's, let's get your views then, Annika. Let's start with you on where you see the Fed position itself, the optionality that Jay Powell is hoping to give him and the team there as a result of a faster taper and where that leaves us in terms of the pace of rate hikes and the timing of rate hikes, Annika. What is your assessment? Good morning. Well, it, it feels to be consensual that, you know, the hawkishness is, is going ahead with full steam. So, you know, a uh, rate hikes, you know, two or maybe even three rate hikes next year instead of the thoughts of only one, um, but also in terms of the tapering, that tapering could, well, it could essentially end already at the end of Q1 versus the end of Q2. But I think what's, mm. what's more important here is the new paradigm we're entering. And that new paradigm is it feels like Powell, the Fed, shifting focus finally 
away from Wall Street to Main Street. It feels that this need to prop up and prop up markets, provide that Fed put, has abated. The S&P is up, what is it, almost 50 percent since the end of 2019. And I think the paramount point is this. Even if the Fed does hike aggressively, even if from June of next year we're talking about 25 basis points of hikes every quarter in an aggressive scenario, by the end of 2023, we would still be around 2% or maybe even lower, which is below the 2018 interest rate level. And more importantly, will probably still result in a negative real yield territory. That's what it's all about, the negative real yield. The, the support of the negative real yield, and you say that this is a pivotal moment, the shift to Main Street away from Wall Street for the Fed, but part of Main Street, of course, is the jobs picture. Can they do that? Can they be aggressive in the rate hike cycle, but also meet their mandate when it comes to employment? Well, I think the, the beauty of how the cycle has progressed is it feels that the economy is truly standing with more robust legs this time round. And it's sort of the economic engine working. So, you know, higher levels of demand, you know, therefore well, growth, therefore more labor demands, therefore labor wages, um, plus the pent up savings, positive environments for corporates to invest, low interest rates, um, high earnings growth, tight, uh, tight supply chains, low stock levels. So from that perspective, it looks like the economic drivers could be strong enough for that to continue. And um, I think the other point, which is very, very important, even with all the uncertainty around Omicron, the point is that the, the, you know, the behavior of people has shifted. People have gotten accustomed to the concept of virus, lockdowns, curfews. There's perspective from vaccines, from boosters. And I think mm. the last point is, Yes, the economy has already been rock solid, but U.S. GDP is only approximately one and a half percent above pre-pandemic levels. And if you adjusted for productivity growth, population growth, it could have actually, you know, we believe it could have actually been around three percentage points higher. So there is ammunition. OK, that is the important context there from Annika. Eddie, let's bring you in at this point. Outline for us the inflationary challenges for the Fed and the credibility challenges as well as they wrestle with these four decade high prices stateside. Yeah, and, and we've seen a little bit more of that uh, over the last couple of days, right? We saw the PPI in, in, in the US coming in above expectations yesterday. And then in the UK as well, inflation really starting to heat up. And that's, that's, that must be worrying for policymakers. And uh, Annika points at the uh, historically low real rates there. And I think this is an important factor for the Fed, right? Because she's right. There's a, there's a, there's a big Fed put in the market, and it has been there for a, for a number of years now. And, you know, I, I wonder whether the market is, is, is ready, really, for that stimulus to be taken away. But it will have to take some hmm. seriously aggressive moves for us to see, uh, you know, real rates in positive territory by next year. OK, Annika, where, where are the opportunities then at this point, if you consider, take into consideration all of those factors that you've outlined for us, those negative uh, real yields and support coming through from earnings, how are you looking to position? Yeah, well, I think, you know, we're, we're back in yield-seeking yield -seeking territory, right, if the negative, uh, negative real yield will persist. And in a yield-seeking environment, you know, two things stand out. I think from an equities perspective, equities still offer um, that yield opportunity, you know, with good companies, with good cash flow generation, dividend payers. But also importantly, from an inflation hedge perspective, the only difference this time round is 2022 will absolutely be the year of stock picking. That's really our hmm. fundamental conviction. Because, you know, the days of sort of overarching, wide blanket, post-pandemic, indiscriminate buying are simply over. So that, that is certainly a window. And I think especially, you know, we believe especially within Europe, Europe really has a lot to offer from a macroeconomic perspective, from a catch-up perspective, from a monetary policy backdrop perspective, but also simply from a valuation perspective. So that, that is a big opportunity area. OK, 2022 is the year of stock picking, Annika. I love that call. Eddie, does that align with what you're seeing? And where are you looking to hedge inflation? What are you hearing from market participants? 
You know, inflation hedges have been really hard to come by. If you if you just look at gold's reaction on that PPI beat yesterday, gold actually dropped significantly, um, and and that's despite real real yields not moving uh, very much. And uh, you know what? I think. I think for me, uh, yes, stocks, absolutely. Things like banks will be very interesting on higher yields. But I worry about the call for stock picking because, you know, active management has been in decline for a number of years. And I just don't see investors changing their ways very much on that particular one. OK, Eddie van der Velt, challenging Annika Trey on there on the case for stock picking in 2022 and active management. Annika, we'll get your response to that after the break. Uh, who's Annika's staying with us, I'm very pleased to say. Uh, and we'll get more uh, from Annika just in the next couple of minutes. Eddie van der Velt from NYT, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, we're going to dive into the latest economic data from China. We've been talking about the fact it shows signs of a slowdown and a worrying new study on the effectiveness of the Sinovac vaccine, the implications of all of that. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. China's economy slowed further in November, dragged down by a worsening property market slump and disruptions from repeated COVID outbreaks. Let's bring in then Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Ender Curran, who joins us out of Hong Kong. Ender, uh, talk us through the data then and where it leaves policymakers in Beijing. Well, this was a big read for November, Tom, and the big takeaway really is no sign of a bottom in the slowdown yet. Retail sales may be a standout. There had been an expectation that Singles Day, the big online shopping bonanza, would lift things. But actually, retail sales still came in on the soft side. Uh, restaurants and catering hit, especially as was automobile sales. And, as, and that's being attributed, of course, to the negative spillover from both the real estate slowdown and the ongoing sporadic breakouts of COVID. The investment side of things was also softer or misforecast, and, and that's being attributed to the ongoing ructions in the real estate sector as well. The bright side was on industrial output. That's uh, turning, trending upwards, reflecting the ongoing demand for Chinese-made goods as the export story booms. So I think the big takeaway from today's numbers was they were soft, uh, they haven't yet hit a bottom, and it does mean that policymakers will have to tip more support into China's economy in the near term. Um, Ender, we've been getting a couple of competing lines on the effectiveness of the Sinovac vaccine, used, of course, very widely across China, but in also uh, many other parts uh, of the world. Uh, what, are we, what are we hearing and what are the potential implications? As you say, different signals, Tom. On the one hand, the University of Hong Kong study making the point that two shots of Sinovac really aren't uh, very effective against new variant Omicron. Sinovac themselves have their own study making the point that if you have a third shot, a booster shot, you know, you're, you're pretty well, prote you get extra, pr you're protected. Uh, I think the takeaway is, you know, it's still early. Both s s samples are clearly small for these vaccines. It's still early days. But either way, it does certainly raise questions about the effectiveness of this vaccine, not just for China, but of course for the emerging world where the Sinovac has been especially popular. It will also raise questions about the durability of China's aggressive zero COVID approach, uh, given the extra transmissibility of Omicron. Can they really can keep up that strategy? Is it, sustain is it sustainable? So it's another negative takeaway from the uh, Omicron story so far. As I say, there will be more analysis on, on these vaccines and others over coming weeks. But right now, I think people are saying it certainly doesn't point to it. It's certainly not an up arrow uh, mm. story when it comes to China's economy. OK, thank you for getting us up to speed. As ever, Ender Curran, Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, joining us out of Hong Kong. Still with us is Annika Treon, Van Lanshot Camp and head of Competence Centre. Annika, thank you for joining us. JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs saying now is the time to load up on Chinese assets, saying that some of the pressures around real estate and the crackdown on technology and the slowdown in the recovery as well have now been priced in. Is that a view you align with? Yeah, so we, we still find China um, very complex. And indeed, you know, the, the big shock to the from the real estate sector, and I think, you know, 
market participants are still underestimating how significant this is for the entire GDP. And, you know, it's thought to be approximately a third of the weighting of, you know, the entire nation's GDP if you look at real estate and adjacent areas around that. So we actually still find that challenging. And what we see in terms of contrast of areas where you know, economies do look more robust, where fundamentals do look strong, where valuations are still very exciting, where there are still secular growth trends around that, is actually within, within the real asset space, but looking at real assets in, you know, in Europe, looking at real assets in the US, looking at other countries where there are very specific situations, because the beauty of real assets is in a real negative yield environment, which we expect to persist, the beauty is you get the um, indexation of the of the income stream, you know, with the inflation hedges, whether it's a concession contract or the rental contracts for property assets. But the other side of it is you really have that bond-like revenue stream coming in, fulfilling that search for yields. And in areas where there are true secular trends going on, be it, you know, the energy transition infrastructure needs, be it e-commerce related um, logistics or data centers or housing shortages. Mm. So that's that's a space we're very excited about. But that's a space that we fundamentally believe has a lot more inherent complexities around it, especially around sustainability than the broader market perceives. And that's where um, Alpha can be achieved. OK, alpha out of real assets, that is an opportunity, particularly when you're looking to hedge inflation. The call there from Annika Treon. Thank you very much indeed. Van Lanschot Kampen, head of Competence Centre. OK, coming up, 99 Tory rebels voted against their embattled Prime Minister. In a vote on Covid curves, we're going to dig into the details and the implications for Prime Minister Boris Johnson next. This is Bloomberg. The eyes to the right, 369. The nose to the left, 126. Wow. Oh. Boris Johnson's authority as Prime Minister has taken a hit after he suffered his biggest rebellion since becoming Prime Minister. Nearly 100 MPs from his very own Conservative Party opposed his plan to mandate so-called COVID passes at nightclubs and other venues in the UK. That left the government to rely on opposition votes to implement new COVID curbs to stop the spread of the Omicron variant. Joining us now is Bloomberg opinion columnist Therese Raphael, who earlier this week wrote a piece entitled, in fact, Is Partygate a Crisis Too Many for Johnson? You can read her columns in full on Bloomberg.com and O-P-I-N, go. Therese, has then Boris Johnson lost the support of the nation and his party? You were talking about Partygate, the scandals around the parties in Downing Street, number 10 Downing Street, and now, of course, we have this very significant rebellion. Where does it leave the Prime Minister? Yeah, I mean, I think the rebellion consists of different tribes within the Tory party, and... Uh, Different MPs voted against uh, these measures or some of these measures, but especially the um, vaccine passports for different reasons. So some Tories simply oppose uh, constraints on personal liberty. Um, they don't believe the vaccine passports uh, asking for certification before entry into large venues are going to work. They, uh, you know, cite Scotland, uh, for example, to say that they didn't work there. Uh, other Tory MPs are you know, more broadly looking for uh, better government guidance and a vision going forward in the pandemic. They think that this is a government that lurches from crisis to crisis, that imposes measures sort of, uh, you know, without really having um, a, a broader plan going forward. Um, and there are some, you know, as you mentioned, Partygate that are you know, very tired of a month of headlines in which uh, the government's uh, integrity, its judgment, the prime minister's own grip on, on his government are all called into question. So I think, you know, that 
size of a rebellion reflects mm. a number of different things, not all of them to do precisely with the restrictions that are in question. And, you know, mm. the matter for Johnson going forward is whether he can unite at least some of these strains of his party behind an agenda uh, in the new year. Now, I mean, I think it's notable that he tried very hard to convince mm. MPs not to vote against his measures. So he addressed MPs. He had, you know, the chief medical officer and scientific officers making their case. He went to the 1922 okay. Committee of Backbenchers, and none of that seemed to work. Okay, Bloomberg Opinions, uh, Therese Raphael, on the implications of that vote for Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the pressure he's getting uh, from his backbenchers and other members of his uh, party. Thank you very much uh, indeed. We're taking live pictures of the Federal Chancellor of Germany, of course, Olaf Scholz, giving his first speech to the Bundestag as new German uh, Chancellor. He's been talking about the plans around restricting the vaccine or the spread of the virus, uh, but also geopolitics as well. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. It is Fed Day, a Powell hawkish tilt and a faster taper look all but certain. The ECB and other major central banks decide this week. Omicron may evade Sinovac. A study says it doesn't provide sufficient antibodies. The WHO is concerned that the new variant is being dismissed as mild. And Boris Johnson suffers his biggest rebellion since taking office, but passes his new COVID rules. UK inflation surges to its highest level in over a decade. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie here in London in our studio. Let's check in then on the markets. We had the sell-off at stateside. It was the Nasdaq that led things lower. Big tech cap names being dragged lower on the back of that high PPI number, almost 10% stateside. And then you had some modest losses across the Asian space as well as that economic uh, data came through on China. Today, though, in terms of Europe, you're seeing modest gains of three-tenths of a percent. Technology is the outstanding sector at this point, at least gaining more than one percent. The pound is strengthening three-tenths of a percent at 132. And Sydney World is the stock that's in focus for us on the back of a court ruling in Canada that it has to pay a severance fee of about a billion US dollars. Sydney World is going to appeal that decision. Nonetheless, it's down almost 30 percent, as you can see, the UK listed. Cinema chain. OK, let's get back to the macro then. Fed Day and the US Central Bank, of course, retiring the word transitory. We know about that to describe inflation. Let's put that to one side. Bloomberg Economics, though, says that the forecast may be fragile. Any more supply chain bottlenecks could turn that prediction on its head. Joining us now is Rafaela Tenconi, Woods and Company Chief Economist. Rafaela, thank you for joining us this morning. How do you see the Fed wrestling with the inflationary pressures, will they be forced to hike more aggressively than the markets are currently pricing in? Hi, good morning. Yeah, I think uh, ultimately the Fed, just like any central bank in the world, has to come to terms with the fact that inflation is sticky. It's going to come down at some point, but will remain elevated and the recovery is robust. So we think we are heading into fast taper, maybe that it ends as, as soon as March. And uh, the dot plot's probably signaling two rate hikes of 25 basis points in the second half of the year. And there is certainly going to be the risk that we may see three uh, in 2022. And you talk about being tipped into recession, the US economy. You say it's almost inevitable. And you set a time frame on this within 15 to 18 months. Rafaela, talk us through that time frame and how we get to that recessionary tip for the US economy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we live in a world where the market thinks that central banks can fine tune the business cycle forever. But unfortunately, where we are, it's too advanced. There is too much inflation. So the Fed, just like anybody else, has a very strict mandate and it only has one the facto tool to tame inflation in the long run, which is to slow activity so much that you go into, into recession. So 
Between the lags of monetary policy that is anywhere between 12 months and 18 months, the fact that recovery still has stamina, although it has bits and pieces that some of them are stronger than others. So we think that the tapering itself is a monetary tightening phenomenon that is fairly significant, but not sufficient. We think 100 basis points, up to 100 basis points in 12 months is not enough to really trigger recession. But then we think over the course of 2022 and 2023, 200 basis points looks completely plausible when you have inflation running consistently above 4%. And given that the Fed is highly levered and also has high exposure to equity prices, then we think that is enough to eventually create the conditions that you will be in recession or heading into recession by the second half of 2023. Obviously, part of this is a central part of this is the inflationary picture. And you point to that and whether or not 200 basis points is enough to rein in inflation that you say is looking more sticky. I think it's looking more sticky. Well, what do you see in the inflation breakdown? And you see very clearly in the November release, but it has been there for several months, is that housing is a source of inflation, particularly in the US, and consistently surprises us up to the upside. Um, the other thing is we see surveys on pricing intention of companies, again, consistently signaling that they're going to have to pass on higher costs. They do face higher costs due to supply disruptions, but most importantly, they face costs because we're, we've decided that we're digitalizing whole economies with a green transition, with ESG, with just the deployment of AI and all of the rest of the digital technologies. These are meaningful investments that were not there before. And when you have an economy that actually is robust, then of course you're gonna to have to pass on higher costs. So that's why I say that inflation is going to be a lot more sticky than people think, because when you look beyond the oil price effect, there is still ample signal that uh, that inflation is going to be higher than before. OK, Raffaella Tanconi from Wood and Company, thank you. Uh, staying with us, uh, getting the views, of course, on the inflationary picture and the need uh, for a more aggressive uh, rate hike cycle from the Fed, possibly other central banks as well. Get more uh, from Raffaella shortly. Coming up, making fashion more sustainable. We're going to bring you some of our interview with the iconic handbag designer Anya Hindmarch. Her thoughts on changing fashion's economic model and what drives her to be green. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. We're bringing you live pictures of Federal Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, giving his first speech to the Bundestag as the new German Chancellor. That is not Olaf Scholz, but Olaf Scholz was speaking earlier and he was talking about the plans to, of course, reduce the spread of the pandemic and also geopolitics and the need to press back on Russia and the build-up of troops around Ukraine. We heard from Schultz saying that the EU needs to coordinate foreign affairs policy uh, and that Schultz is saying he's deeply concerned about Ukraine border issues. Also saying that in terms of the vaccine mandate, of course, there's been a lot of discussion about that in Germany. The vaccine mandate will be, will be decided by the German parliament. That was from Olaf Schultz, of course, who has been, now you see him, with his mask on, uh, sitting and listening to one of his counterparts, Olaf Scholz, of course, speaking uh, to the Bundestag for his first time as German Chancellor, uh, taking a seat there as he listened to one of his colleagues, but outlying previously his plans to halt the spread of the pandemic, saying that ultimately Germany will win uh, this fight. OK, 
Uh, let's uh, switch focus then to all things green and fashion. A bit of a pivot there. Not many people have managed to capture both the fashion and the business worlds, uh, quite like the British Hamburg designer Anya Hindmarch. From Princess Diana to Kendall Jenner, who's she? Uh, she's won fans around the world with her range of luxury bags, turning her eponymous label into a fashion powerhouse. But Hindmarch has also become known for her stance on sustainability, collaborating with supermarkets to try to eliminate single-use plastic and becoming an ambassador for Greenpeace. She spoke with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix and they started off by discussing what drives her to be more green. I'm quite scared by this climate situation. Well, I'm very scared by this climate situation. And I think that, you know, we only look at this last summer and look at the flash floods and the, the fires and the, you know, the, the, the heat waves. Um, and, you know, imagine if that was a monthly situation. And I think that, you know, we all have to change our behavior, I think, yeah. um, and what we do. And, um, and so I think, you know, I have a, I, I love fashion with purpose. That's yeah. actually interesting for me. I think it's very hard to, Imagine anything being very luxurious in fashion if it's doing harm. So for me, it's, it's um, I suppose it's my happy place. It's what I'm interested in and, and feel I should do. How's it working with the UK supermarkets? I mean, this is where you have you know, much more of an impact because it reaches so many people. Mm. Well, what's interesting about, what's really particularly fascinating for, for me with this project is that, and it's an iterative project to a certain extent, but we, we're working with Sainsbury's and with Wait Waitrose and we're talking to so many more supermarkets, it's open to every supermarket around the world, um, with the idea that it's actually about eco, not ego. And I, I think that collaboration is going to be the way to solve uh, a lot of these problems. It's not about siloed little profit centers. And it's quite hard, of course, for all of us, including any supermarket, to think in that way because we're so kind of geared and bred mm -hmm. to, to think about our own businesses and our own sort of, you know, sort of shareholders. But actually, it is the solution. And it's been really interesting. That side of it has been almost the most innovative aspect of the project, actually. And do you see a big shift, actually, in, in fashion overall? Because at the same time, you know, you make profit by selling. And so how do you match the two? You have to sell more, but also you want to be more sustainable. It's a really hard sort of circle to square that, and I think it's a really important question because actually um, we need to maintain a healthy economy. We know that probably the thing that will answer the climate issues um, the most effectively will be big governments paying off less wealthy governments to you know to stop deforestation or whatever it might be. So we need to make sure that we're we're buying things and contributing to tax so that we can do these good things. And so and and of course you know we need to employ people, and fashion is a fantastic employer. So how do you square that circle? And I think the fact is that we all need to carry and buying and purchasing yeah. but buy better buy less buy better it's the classic thing so you know if you're gonna buy five t-shirts here buy two but buy really good t-shirts um, the same for, for, for bags and, and for any aspect of any clothing and do you think there's a shift overall for fashion to be more sustainable and is that driven by you know stakeholders by chief executives and entrepreneurs or is it actually the end consumer that just wants to buy better you know, I think what's lovely is it's coming from both both ends, but it's actually coming particularly from the younger generation, and quite right too. I mean, it's going to, it will touch them without a doubt. Um, you know, the climate situation. So I love the fact that it's my kids who are the most passionate. Um, but I feel very, very responsible. I mean, we, you know, it's a bit like smoking. We didn't know it harmed us when we were smoking. You know, it's the same with the climate. So it, I feel very responsible, and I, I just think that you know we're far from perfect, but we're just trying to chip off every bit we can and communicate loudly about it. It's really fun. It's exciting. And and you don't have to not be successful. In fact, I would argue, I think you could be more successful by having a responsible business. If you look at fashion, a lot of the times you have big boards, but you, you have a position which is a chief sustainability officer. D does that chief sustainability officer actually have to become the chief executive for real change? Possibly, possibly. I mean, it has to be a massive part of the main agenda you know it, it's hard because and especially in a pandemic you know people are trying to save jobs keep you know all the sort of plates spinning make sure they're they're moving forward on on all their objectives but I think sometimes also I think that whilst it's really important to have your agenda your journey to of course and in big companies that's essential because it's huge moving parts and and it's very disruptive any change is very complicated but I also think sometimes it's just about grabbing little bits as you can and and the more you do the more you do um, so um, but it there's no way out of this I mean for sure we've all seen an a pandemic what we're capable of in terms of change and so this is now the next huge well let's get through Omicron first but the next huge huge challenge. Fashion designer Anya Hindmarch there speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. Okay this is Bloomberg in fact we are gonna continue our conversation I believe with Raffaella Tenconi Woods and Company Chief 
economist. It's worth pointing out that this is Bloomberg, though, for our viewers. Raffaella, thank you for sticking around. I want to get your views then as we shift away from the focus on the Fed to the divergence within these central banks, the positioning of the ECB and the BOE on Thursday. We've got the BOJ on Friday. Let's put that one to one side. But the ECB and the BOE and the divergence that we're seeing with the Fed, does the Fed necessarily, the gravity, the pull of gravity from the Fed, pull those central banks in the next 12 to 24 months along that path to a more hawkish policy stance? Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, the Fed faces worse inflation today already, whereas in the case of Europe and lagging even more Japan, inflation, or rather the political backlash against inflation, is still ahead of us. So we think the ECB at this stage will continue to duck, maybe pretends that inflation is still transitory, and in any case, it has one more clarification of QE to do. But we think actually 2022 will bring the most surprise from Europe because we expect already by the second half of 2022, the ECB will have to deliver 50 basis points of tightening on the deposit rate and will have to deliver a further 100 basis points in 2023. So if you think about it, actually ECB and Fed will deliver very similar magnitudes of tightening. And the difference between the two economies is that Europe still benefits from greater fiscal easing already in 2022. So I think the market will be surprised on how resilient the Eurozone economy is, or Europe in general. And that is really the catch for the ECB. The labor market is actually tight in Europe. It's possibly tighter than in the US when you look at the actual job numbers. So I think neither Europe and eventually nor Japan can really escape the tide as turned. Rafael, that's a pretty interesting call that the surprise are going to come through from the strength uh, of the, the European economy. And you're talking about volatility across the, across the board, really, uh, when it comes to asset prices. Where is the volatility going to be felt most acutely? Well, is really the actual interest rate tightening that I think brings the bulk of the volatility. Um, but in general, my thinking is central bankers are addressing this transition in the way they've always addressed the previous business cycles. And to some extent, this is legitimate because this is what is strictly written in their mandate, right? I mean, they have an average inflation target. It's very specific index. It's a very specific mandate. But the problem is that when you digitalize economies, it's just what we are doing now. There are two fundamental changes which have broad macroeconomic implications. So digitalization unevens the competitive landscape. It has a tendency to create more oligopolistic power than before. So this is a source of the stickiness of inflation. And the more years pass, the more evident this will also show in the CPI basket. The other issue is that the labor market becomes more polarized. You can still have mm. plenty of jobs. In fact, you may even have more jobs than previous cycles, but the spread of the gains becomes significantly uneven. So this is where the okay. political backlash comes. Okay, Raphael Tanconi, we have to leave it there. Running out of time, but thank you for your insights this morning. Wood and Company Chief Economist. Okay, let's get your Bloomberg Business Flash now with Leanne Garrett. Leanne. Good morning, Tom. UK inflation surged more than expected to its highest level in more than a decade in November, adding pressure on the Bank of England to raise interest rates. Consumer prices rose 1.5% from a year earlier, boosted by the cost of clothing, petrol and second-hand cars. The reading presents a challenge for BOE policymakers who are also weighing the risks of the Omicron variant to the economy. Now, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has suffered his biggest parliamentary rebellion since becoming leader. Almost 100 Conservatives opposed his plan to mandate the use of so-called COVID passes at nightclubs and other venues here in England. Johnson was forced to rely on opposition party votes to get the measure through. This is a significant blow to the UK leader's authority and comes ahead of a special parliamentary election this week. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom.
Leanne, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, the US House voted for more borrowing power, raising the nation's debt ceiling to $2.5 trillion. We'll get the details. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Switching focus to the politics of the US, the House voting to raise the nation's debt ceiling by $2.5 trillion. The amount should buy the government some time as it intends to extend its borrowing authority past next year's congressional elections and into early 2023. A single Republican representative voted in favour of the bill. Joining me to discuss is our DC Morning Editor, Kathleen Hunter. So, Kathleen, how helpful is it for Democrats to have gotten this off their plates, at least as they look ahead to the midterms? Well, it's a really big deal because Democrats are struggling now to really work against the clock. They have this closing legislative window before the midterm elections. Their priority is to get through President Joe Biden's tax and spend proposal, the Build Back Better proposal, which has been a hot topic of debate in Congress since, you know, for most of this past year. And really the sense is that there's a closing window of time uh, in early 2022, the end of this year, for them to complete that legislation before the focus really shifts to the midterms. And it would be problematic for Democrats, both logistically, to keep having to consider this debt limit increase if they hadn't gotten it off the table. That would have been pro that would have taken time away from the uh, President Biden's agenda. And also, it would be would have been problematic politically because the closer we get to the midterm elections, the bigger it's going to be a potential li the bigger liability it's going to be for Democrats to raise the debt ceiling, um, you know, as the election is coming closer, because we already know that Republicans are going to try to make mm. this a um, issue for Democrats in the midterms. Any, any downsides for the Dems from this? Well, politically, that's the problem, is that Republicans have put Democrats in this tricky position of being, with one exception that you mentioned, the one Republican who voted for this, being the party that kind of has to own this debt ceiling increase. The Republicans, usually these debt ceiling increases are passed on a bipartisan basis. But this one time, they've done this special process where Democrats only have really voted for it. And that's a clear signal from Republicans that they intend to make uh, Democrats out to be the party of big spending ahead of these midterm elections. And so we'll have to see how, those, how that messaging plays out and whether that does become a liability for Democrats as they try to keep control of Congress next November. Kathleen Hunter, our DC Morning Editor, on the implications, the importance of this ceiling, debt ceiling being raised, at least voted on in the House. Thank you very much indeed. Let's check in on the markets then on, of course, a central day when it comes to the Federal Reserve, its decision making about the taper and where it positions that central bank in terms of the rate hike cycle. You're seeing gains in Europe of three tenths of a percent. Technology is the outperformer on the sector basis, getting more than one percent. The futures, though, stateside. NASDAQ futures pointed to the losses of three tenths of a percent after closing lower by more than 1% yesterday. Plenty more ahead. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Matt Miller in Berlin, Caroline Hyde and Anna Edwards in London. This is Bloomberg. The market's view is that Inflation isn't going to last a long time and that growth will decelerate next year. Central Bank 101 is you kind of want to look through some of the, if you like, supply driven increase in inflation. I'm expecting the Fed to not make a policy mistake. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, December the 15th. Our top stories today. Waiting for the Federal Reserve, policymakers are expected to decide whether to boost the taper rate and the pace of likely interest rate hikes. 
Raising the ceiling, the House averts a possible default by voting to increase the debt limit. And putting down the revolt, Boris Johnson survives his biggest rebellion since becoming Prime Minister. He needs opposition votes, though, to survive a parliamentary uprising by his fellow Conservatives. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Uh, from London, I'm Anna Edwards with Caroline Hyde in for Kayleigh Lines. Matt Miller is, of course, with us from Berlin. And Matt, the markets, they waver as we wait for Jerome Powell and the Fed. Yeah, wavering a little bit, but we do still see a uh, weak uh, picture out of Asia. Take a look at what's going on. Well, this is the European map, and you can see a, a little bit of a mix here. Um, and if you take a look at Asia, you'll see Hong Kong is down. The Hang Seng down one-tenth of one percent. This on concern, of course, that the U.S. is going to blacklist companies there. We're going to talk with Tom McKenzie about that, and that the economy in general is just slowing down. Um, it's not just the chip companies. We're going to talk about SMIC, but Wushi Biologics is also the biggest loser, down 20% because there's concern that um, biotechs are going to be uh, blacklisted in that FT report. We read about that. The Philippines also down 1.5% after they discovered their first Omicron case. So we're seeing just down arrows across Asia. We're not seeing much of a bid, though, for the yen. In fact, right now, the dollar is a little bit stronger against the yen, although it's weaker against most major trading partners. In terms of U.S. futures, just about 20 minutes ago, I looked and we were up pretty decently. Now the S&P is down just a little bit, but Bloomberg News is saying that traders are bracing themselves for the Fed meeting today. I have an image of John O'Hara at the Barclays Post being strapped into his trading chair by Frankie and Mikey P getting ready for the meeting. Um, Bloomberg U.S. dollar index is down just a little bit, but still at a relatively high level, 1187. So as I said, it's up against some major trading partners. Um, it's up against the yen, as we just saw, but down against some others. Not a lot of action there. Really, this is typically what you see, of course, Anna, when you get a, an important Fed decision uh, like this or an important jobs number. A lot of times, traders will sit on their Hulk hands. Uh, NYMEX crude down 1% right now, and we see Brent crude down as well. $70 even a barrel. So that's uh, a really a down arrow sign for economic momentum, for demand, and Bitcoin up a little bit. Now, Bitcoin has been a risk asset. Um, Carolyn Hyde argues that's what you see uh, with the cryptocurrency. <laughs> and so judging by that, I guess we're doing okay, although it's at a, such a low level, right? Compared to the record high of 69,000, we're only at $48,543. Caroline? You know what? With PPI yesterday out of the US and with inflation out of the UK today, should we call Bitcoin an inflation hedge today? Maybe that's why it's on the upside. Meanwhile, there is a mixed picture you were looking at a little bit of a moment ago, but Matt, we're, we're actually trading higher if you look at the stock 600 in general. After five straight days of losses, the worst losing streak since March 2020, we managed to pick ourselves up a little bit. The UK not looking so pretty. They're off by four tenths of percent. I'll explain why in a moment, but the CAC 40 up seven tenths of percent. Italy getting a bit of a bid. Germany, of course, the all-important country up four tenths of percent. Let's kick it on and have a look at why UK perhaps is in the red. It's all about, well, what the pound is up to. Higher, up two tenths of a percent. The Great British Pound lifts higher because we've had the strongest inflation reading in a decade above 5%. But will the Bank of England still sit on their Hulk hands today? I'm looking at natural gas, your daily check-in. Actually, down today, we're seeing maybe a little bit of a better gas flow coming from Russia into Europe. Remember, we've seen, though, natural gas up 23% over the course of the week. Inditex lower as their margins come under pressure. Key retailer across, of course, based in Spain, across the world they own Zara and the like and record numbers in terms of sales and profit but not good enough as we worry about margin pressure and Cineworld I mean when does the cinema and the theatre chain catch a break off by 28% that's as it looks as though a rival is going to they're being forced to pay almost a billion dollars for not making that purchase in Canada dire say the analysts it really erodes most of their equity value Anna yeah they wanted to expand in North America didn't they Caroline the timing of that offer for the Canadian uh, movie chain December December 2019. They tried to back away. The judges say no. Uh, let us have a look at some of the things that are on our agenda for today. European leaders are meeting with their counterparts from Eastern Europe, most notably with Ukraine, with tensions in Russia at unprecedented highs. This summit is seen as an opportunity to present a united front. Are they united on everything that they're going to be discussing, though? We'll talk about that later. China said uh, President Xi Jinping will hold a video meeting with Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin, and it is the Fed rate decision of course today 2 p.m 
New York time. Bloomberg Eco Economics expects the central bank to take a sharp, hawkish turn, both in tone and in substance. For more on the Fed decision, Michael McKee, Bloomberg Chief Economics and Policy Correspondent, joins us now. Uh, Mike, it's really interesting to think about how hawkish this Fed is going to be. We seem to have been talking about the hawkish pivot for some time. So uh, do we think we're going to get hawkish announcements about what they're actually going to do and hawkish commentary to go along with that? Well, the interesting thing, Anna, is that the market expects a hawkish Fed. So at this point, it's not so much what the Fed says it does as it is how close does that come to what Wall Street, global Wall Street, is expecting. They do think that the Fed is going to speed up or it's tapering by about $30 billion a month, and that would get them finished by March, so they could start raising rates then if they wanted to. They got to increase their inflation forecast. They're way behind the curve on that. And the dot plot, uh, the Wall Street consensus seems to be the Fed will tell us or suggest they're going to do two rate hikes in 2022, followed by three the year after that and three in 2023, uh, 24. The only question is uh, why the market thinks the Fed will be so slow off the mark in 2022. And for that, we're going to have to listen to Jay Powell as he explains uh, where he thinks the economy is going. Uh, in terms of um, what would surprise us today, Anna has, has raised this, and I think it's really interesting. Is it possible for Powell to surprise us hawkishly? Because it looks like the markets may be bracing for that a little bit. It's unlikely, Matt, that he would surprise hawkishly because the Fed is going to say, or Jay Powell is going to probably say, that the end, the end of tapering, which may, as I say, come in March, isn't necessarily tied to a rate increase. The Fed wants optionality. They want to see where the inflation numbers are by the time we get to March and where they think the economy is going before they start raising rates. So this is going to move us in a hawkish direction, but it's not going to set a particular timeline for Fed action. We want to thank you so much, Mike McKee. We all await with anticipation what happens with the Fed and stay on Bloomberg surveillance for our special coverage. The Fed decides today, 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. right here in London. Now over to Washington because the House, well, you know what? It actually voted to raise the nation's debt ceiling by $2.5 trillion, extending the government's borrowing authority past next year's congressional elections and averting a potential government default. The measure now goes to President Biden for his signature. Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us from D.C. I mean, the market seemed to stop worrying about this, but how important was it that they managed to get this over the line? This is really important. I mean, you remember a couple months ago when we were having this similar debate about raising the debt limit, the markets were all over the place. There was a lot of concern. This time, Democrats and Republicans said, hey, we have a deal on how to get this done. And it's pretty much followed that particular timeline. Of course, the deadline uh, from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen being today. But we've also heard reports from other credible institutions saying that even if they didn't get this done by today, the U.S. still would have time to make its necessary payments. But this really clears Democrats up to go back to focusing on presidents, President Biden's social policy and tax plan. That's the one that's currently in the Senate. President Biden met with Senator Joe Manchin yesterday, trying to really figure out what that path forward on that's going to be. But at, at this point, Congress is really wrapping up what it's going to be doing for the year. Uh, the House has left town, and, and we don't expect them to be back unless the Senate sends over uh, that Biden policy bill. In terms of, you know, that this is looking at the future, right? In terms of looking at the past, what do we know about um, Mark Meadows, the possibility of a conviction for him? So from what we've seen at this point, when Congress has issued a, a cr criminal contempt, as the U.S. House did last night, it's not something that happens immediately. Usually the stuff goes to the courts. It's, it's partly up to involves the Department of Justice as to whether they want to look into this. Meadows, Trump's former chief of staff, claims that he has executive privilege, that he has helped the committee to a certain extent, turning over text messages and emails, some of those which we've seen, but that he is his executive privilege prevents him from from actually testifying to the committee. And this is something we've often seen with Congress. They try and do this investigative oversight work. They try and compel people to come and give testimony. Uh, those individuals say no way. And then it goes to the courts where things inevitably get held up for sometimes years and really wind up delaying Congress's work in looking into some of these oversight matters.
Emily Wilkins, the Bloomberg government in Washington, giving us the past, the present, the future. And indeed, let's talk about the future right now, because Biden administration is considering well, whether to impose tougher sanctions on Chinese well, companies, one of them being the largest chip maker. That would build on an effort to limit the country's access to advanced technology. To hear, to break it all down, Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie. And once again, just the relationship between the US and China in the crosshairs. Yeah, and particularly when it comes to key technology like semiconductors. And SMIC, as you said, is the largest semiconductor maker in China. China, of course, over the last few years, under the Trump administration, specifically trying to pivot and ensure that it can build out its own semiconductor industry. It's still a long way from being able to produce the most advanced chips. But SMIC was at the front line of that effort to do that. And now we're hearing that the National Security Council in Washington will be meeting on Thursday. They want to toughen up the language, according to the reporting, to make it more difficult for American suppliers of the equipment needed to process and manufacture these chips to be able to export those to SMIC. China coming out saying this is political, it's ideological, it's not about the economics of this. So pushback, not surprisingly, uh, from China. But it's another blow for SMIC's ambitions and the nation's ambitions yeah. to get a head start on this. It's certainly geopolitical tension and we'll yeah. watch that. Let me ask you also about the, uh, the preparedness of China for the Omicron variant, Tom, because we've had some really interesting revelations surrounding the Sinovac vaccine, uh, Coronavac, over, overnight. And, of course, in the West, we obsess a lot about the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna, mm -hmm. Johnson & Johnson, also uh, here in the UK in the early days, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, we focus there, but actually we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that one of the most administered vaccines was Sinovac. What, what, have, what have we learned? Absolutely. 2.3 billion doses of Sinovac have gone out across the world, a lot of those in China as well, but of course to developing nations that have needed the ability to use this vaccine. And we've had a sample study. The sample was relatively small, 25, but led by a very respected epidemiologist and scientist in Hong Kong. And the finding essentially is that Sinovac gives no protection against Omicron if you have two doses. Now, Sinovac quickly came out with their own study mm. saying, in fact, there is a bit of protection if you add a booster then it gets it back up to kind of 90 percent levels but they haven't published in the journal yet so a bit of skepticism there we've always realized we was known and in fact chinese officials have said this that sinovac and sinopharm the two big vaccines produced there have their vulnerabilities it's why i came back and got pfizer very quickly after getting my two <laughs> sinopharm i'm glad i did but there are real implications for china and its ability to open up if and when it gets to that point very real implications for supply chains potentially yes. and also China's yes. loss of diplomatic capital, given that it's been supplying these shots to so many developing countries. One of our colleagues calling uh, the Chinese population COVID naive to reflect the lack of natural exposure that they've mm -hmm. had, the lack Absolutely. of natural antibodies built up, of course, because of the uh, zero tolerance and lockdowns. Uh, Tom, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie with the latest on some Chinese news flow. That was something that weighed on the Hong Kong session, to some extent the Chinese session. Matt, what do you see uh, ahead of the US session? I see a lot of interesting movers ahead of the U.S. Se session. If you type M-O-S-T space U4, you can see the pre-market movers. The first one that caught my eye was Ferrari. The ticker is race. I was down there on the New York Stock Exchange with John and Frank and Mikey P when uh, they went public. And this is the first up day. It's Wednesday, so the third trading day of the week. The first up day since Lewis Hamilton lost the world championship in an epic race against Max Verstappen. That is being challenged, but Ferrari is finally gaining after losing for the last couple of days. To be fair, it is bouncing around the highest levels it's ever seen. It's traded up around 275, I think, right now at 256. When I was down there on the floor, uh, I went public for, I think, less than $100. Here's Lucid. Um, Lucid is a loser today, and Axios has an HBO special in which the CEO, Peter Rawlinson, calls out Elon Musk for not giving him enough credit uh, for designing the Tesla Model S. Musk then tweeted that Rawlinson wasn't chief designer and had very little to do with it. Lucid is a big loser today in the pre-market, down more than 2%. And just to round it out, I've got Tesla in here as well. <laughs> Actually, we had a story breaking last night that six sexual harassment lawsuits have been brought against Tesla in uh, the Fremont factory, claiming that it's like a construction site, it's like working at a frat house, the stock down 1.2%, which is not a huge move in uh, the big scheme of things. But of course, for a trillion dollar company, that could really move the market today. Anna?
We'll watch to see what happens with Tesla then. Thanks, uh, Matt, for the pre-market briefing. Coming up then, it is Fed Day, of course. We'll preview the decision with Societe Generale's global chief economist, Klaus Bader. He'll be with us shortly. And Tory revolt. Boris Johnson suffers his biggest rebellion since becoming prime minister here in the UK. Plus, don't miss our coverage of the Fed decision and news conference. That starts at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. if you're in London. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Caroline Hyde and Anna Edwards in London. And it is a special day, right? The Fed decides. But it really is an important day for the Fed to decide because we expect Jerome Powell to actually do something. I've got a terminal chart here. For those of you listening on Bloomberg Radio, I will say to you good morning, and we hope you have a fantastic day. What I'm showing our television viewers is something that you probably know already. The expectation for interest rate increases has increased. We're expecting rate hikes sooner than we have before. Eddie Vandervault from Bloomberg MLive joins us now to talk about this. Um, and Eddie, it's interesting, I was talking to Anna about this last couple days, talking with uh, Mike McKee about it just a moment ago. Is there any chance that Jerome Powell can give us a hawkish surprise or are the markets already prepared for that? You know, I think the, the central bankers are finally waking up to this inflation threat. And I think the markets are pricing that in. I'd be very surprised if Powell was more hawkish than he has already been. He's already dropped the transitory language. So I think I think that's probably as far as they want to go. Plus, don't forget, we're getting to the end of the year and they don't want to spook the analysts too much, um, you know, with all of these annual previews that will be that they will be writing right now. So I think I think it's going to be steady as we go from Powell. OK, steady as you go from Powell. That's the focus of today, of course. This week, we're also focused on some 19 other central banks, Eddie, and the Bank of England is amongst them. We've had <laughs> strong numbers in terms of the labour market, really tight labour market in the UK this week. We had really strong inflation numbers versus estimates, over 5%. That was a 10-year high. Does that change your thinking on the Bank of England? Because recently, we've seen expectations pulled back. Yeah, and I think I think the market is going to reprice a little bit, saying that the, the Bank of England might be a little bit more aggressive. The Bank of England would like to step in. But you know, we we've had we've had this the Bank of England already say, look, we, we can't account for something like uh, the natural gas price rises, right? A lot of the inflation push is out of our hand because it is cost push inflation, not demand pull inflation. So it's very hard for the for the Bank of England to control it. But will they try anyway? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I think the market is pricing a slightly more aggressive Bank of England. Yes. Yeah, the pound currently up four tenths of a percent on the back of that inflation data, Eddie. We, of course, have the ECB on the same day, the Bank of England. And I'm reading notes, Sebastian Galli among them from Nordea, for example, saying there could be a slightly less dovish tone. I wouldn't say hawkish, but are you expecting that? And what would be the impact on the euro? Yeah, yeah, I, I read that note this morning too. Uh, as a matter of fact, and, and the 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 Bank of uh, sorry, the, the 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 ECB has been trailing the rest of the central banks, and I think the ECB is still is still somewhat in shock um, from the from the last X number of years where they struggled to get inflation above their targets. So I think that the ECB remains a little bit behind the curve, a little bit behind the the other central banks, um, just because of how much they've suffered in previous years. Eddie, thank you very much. Eddie van der Velt of Bloomberg Markets Live. And if you want expert analysis, you can check out the thoughts of the Markets Live team. MLIV Go is the function to use on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Caroline Hyde with Anna Edwards in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Now let's get to the first word news. The U.S. death toll from the coronavirus pandemic has now passed 800,000. That's according to data compiled by John Hopkins University. More than 200,000 of those deaths occurred after vaccines became widely available last spring. And the U.S. has the highest reported death toll of any country. 
Shares of the United Kingdom's Cineworld plunged after a Canadian court ordered it to pay $965 million in damages to Canada's Cineplex. The British chain walked away from a takeover because of the coronavirus outbreak. Cineworld is the world's second largest movie theatre chain. And Bloomberg's learned that the French billionaire Patrick Drahi is considering a US IPO of Sotheby's. Drahi bought the famed auction house a little more than two years ago for $3.7 billion. Sotheby's has had a strong online sales during the pandemic and has been moving into digital offerings. Of course, therein lies NFTs and the sale thereof. It's sort of a tale of two halves, isn't it, that Sotheby's enabling to get on the digital bandwagon. Cineworld, of course, still feeling the pain of us all getting digital, wanting to stream mm. our movies instead. And, I mean, Muki of the CEO of Cineworld just must be really feeling the pain. That's like the equity basically blown out of the water. Yeah, this fine, a huge fine for a business that size. And as if you thought things couldn't get any tougher for a movie theatre operator, everything they've been through, trying to pull out of that deal, the judge said no, and uh, and the rest will see how it develops. They uh, plan to appeal, of course. Coming up next, Klaus Bader, Societe Generale's global chief economist, joins us. We'll talk about the Fed, of course. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition from London. I'm Anna Edwards with Caroline Hyde in for Kaylee, uh, for Kaylee Lines this week. Uh, Matt Miller is in Berlin with us, of course. And Caroline, uh, looking at where we are on European equity markets and thinking about what lies ahead, of course, the Fed, the big, uh, big story we'll talk to our guest about in just a moment. But some strategists tipping actually European stocks could be the beneficiaries of a hawkish Fed because of the number of value plays, maybe lack of tech names as a whole. Uh, so that's something to think about as we brace ourselves for what the Fed is going to say later. And indeed then what the ECB says the day after that. But it's notable that actually Europe managed to have a decent day today. We're up largely because of technology names of which there are fewer and further between. But mm. this is a day where actually we had five days of losses on Europe. We hadn't seen those sorts of stretch of losses since March 2020, which of course peak COVID. We now seem to be staring down the barrel of once again Omicron concerns. Nevertheless, some money moving into the stock 600 up four tenths of percent. Mm. But these are relatively small moves on in general. Aren't yeah. Yeah, Omicron concerns, also, Matt, tightening, Fed policy tightening concerns, perhaps. Certainly that's uh, reflected by Nasdaq weakness in the futures this morning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we've had gains between law uh, bounces between gains and losses in terms of futures. S&P futures right now, relatively unchanged. They're up at only one one hundredth of one percent. Stocks in Europe, as you can see here, up four tenths of a percent. So we do have gains, although if you look at um, it on an individual basis, the country benchmarks are mixed. The U.S. 10 year is seeing a bid right now, which is interesting, right? If you expect the Fed to get more hawkish eventually to start raising rates, why do you want to own these bonds? Nonetheless, the yield coming down to 143.43 and Bitcoin has now turned down, although it could be called unchanged as well. It's only down three one hundredths of one percent. The level, though, forty eight thousand two ninety two is a bit shocking, especially if you were buying in the 50s or in the 60s. Take a look at some of the pre market movers here. We've got some big companies making big moves, some of them on uh, Bloomberg interviews. Uber CEO yesterday, Derek Azra Shah, he had an exclusive interview with Emily Chang, or we had an exclusive interview with him. In any case, he said, um, OK, I'll go ahead and predict a record year for Uber in 2022. So the shares are trading higher in the pre market right now. Meanwhile, Microsoft is trading lower in the pre-market. Um, software companies have had a rough go of it over the last couple of days. Why threw Adobe in here as well? I saw it uh, moments ago just trading lower in the pre-market. Alphabet as well. I'm going to have to double check this board because I think both of those are down in the pre-market about 1%. Um, but you're seeing some mega cap tech stocks have problems ahead of the Fed meeting and you could see those extend losses at the open. Carolyn, what are you watching? Actually, I'm going to take an Asia flavor. You set us up so well at the start of the hour discussing some of that data that we got out of China, and it's showing weakness, weakness across retail, fixed income, fixed asset investment. This is a great chart that really identifies the slowing nature of the Chinese economy when it comes to investment, whether it comes to housing, infrastructure, manufacturing investment. We did see industrial production pick up a little bit, but actually you dig beneath the surface. That was woeful from a property perspective when you saw the output of cement and steel really drop off by about 20%. Retail sales slowing. Why are we seeing that growth slow down? Because of the worries of Omicron, the worries of, of course, coronavirus in general. What does that mean for the rest of the global economy if you're seeing this sort of pullback in Chinese growth? 
both. Klaus Bader is here. He's the global chief economist over at Societe Generale. And of course, Klaus, you're such an important voice because previous to the global chief economist role, you were head of Asia Pacific as well. So know China so intimately. How important is this sort of setback in the growth story of China for the rest of the world? Well, it is important, it's, but it's particularly important for the Asia region. Um, you know, the, the elasticity of European growth with respect to China is actually pretty low. For about every one percentage point change, you get about 0.1 in Europe. So for Europe, it's important, but it's not a decisive story. But uh, for Asia, it's absolutely key. Um, it's also key for Australia. Um, so it is definitely worrisome. You know, however, I would, I would say at the same time, you, you were certainly right that uh, the worries about uh, COVID in general and Omicron in specifically is definitely the main factor that's weighing on retail sales. Um, we get these rolling lockdowns, re local lockdowns in China. As far as the housing market is concerned, I think uh, the authorities already are uh, shifting course and um, are, are wary of slowing that market too much. Um, if there's one thing Chinese policymakers don't want, it's a housing market collapse. Yes, and the housing market has been a focus of policymakers, Klaus, hasn't it, for some months. So we'll watch, watch that. Uh, good morning to you, Klaus. We are also watching the Fed, of course. It's going to be a big day uh, for markets as we watch to see to what extent we get this hawkish pivot from the Fed. The market seem prepared for hawkishness. Uh, what are you expecting to see later on? Well, I think it's, uh, everybody has pretty much agreed that uh, the tapering is going to be accelerated, um, doubled basically in pace so that the Fed is done with net asset purchases as soon as March. Um, we'll see how, how it goes with uh, interest rates. I mean, here I think what's going to be very important is the so-called dot plot, um, the forecast by uh, FOMC members. And while last time, if you remember, last time at the last meeting, um, they were evenly split between expecting rate increase to begin in 2022 and uh, the other half expecting them only to begin 2023. Um, it's, we definitely expect um, to see a majority um, that, will, that will plumb for rate hikes as soon as 2022. The big question really is, is the median going to predict two increases or three? Um, we, mm. for our part, we expect three increases next year. Um, but, you know, what, when you say that the market is prepared for hawkishness, um, I only partly agree because, you know, the so-called terminal Fed funds rate, i.e. the rate at which the Fed fund um, will at least pause and pause for a significant amount of time, is discount the market at 1.5%. Historically, that's incredibly low. Um, and mm. it would also, with the 10 years, we saw the 10 year earlier, it's basically at uh, 1.4 and change, just under 150, you know, an absolutely flat yield curve. I think there are lots of upside risks on the, on the, uh, on the rates fund. OK, that's really interesting. So focusing on that terminal rate uh, gives you a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, Klaus, what about the way we taper? So you talked about the dots and the hikes that we should then expect later on next year. Um, but what about the taper and the way that that is done? I talked to one investor yes, uh, earlier on today who was saying he dialed back exposure to mortgage-backed securities because he was expecting, of course, a, a, a smaller role for the Fed in that market. How much of that detail are you secure on or what more detail do you want on that? Um... No, it, well, I think the, the, the issue is the following. Um, yes, central banks in general are scaling back their purchases of, uh, of government bonds. But at the same time, of course, government deficits are coming off a lot. Um, and the kind of you know, supply-demand calculation of the bond market is, a, is fraught with risks and uh, basically always goes wrong. Um, so you know, I find it interesting and rather perplexing that the bond market hasn't reacted um, with more concern and hasn't pushed up interest rates um, more than it has. Um, you know, we'll see, we shall see. But uh, the whole you know, background picture, I think, for monetary policy um, is, a, is one that argues for a significant shift in course. And that's not only true in the U.S. It's also true in Europe, um, uh, including the UK. Um, you know, the US labor market is tight as a drum. Um, I calculate, you know, with something which is usual, common only in Japan, which is a jo jobs to applicant ratio. You know, that's close to 1.5% now in the US, and that's extraordinary. Klaus, you are, of course, the global chief economist at SockGen now, but your previous role was running um, the Asia Pacific region. We're so focused on the Fed, and yet we've got a slew of disappointing data out of China, expectations maybe for more stimulus there. How do you see that part of the engine working? Oh, it's very clear that um, the, the monetary policy uh, trends and to some extent also the fiscal policy trend are in diametrically opposed directions between the United States and Western Europe. 
um, and China. But in fact, you know, um, it's really China that is the outlier here. Um, in, um, in most other Asian economies, the trend in monetary policy is at least directed in the opposite in the opposite way. Um, we've already seen a number of central banks tightening interest rates there, um, uh, Korea, etc. Um, this is an interesting cycle also in the way that um, it's actually the emerging market central banks that are leading the way. And that's that's not normal. You know, and the, the normal cycles have been that uh, emerging market central banks tend to follow the Fed, whereas this time you're definitely seeing much sharper moves from emerging market economies. And that makes sense, you know, because for a number of reasons. One, um, high inflation is hitting most of those um, emerging economies when the labor market's very tight. Uh, the emerging market central banks are also more, I think, more determined to mm. slow the housing market. Um, and then thirdly, I think they're, you know, in general, more prone to, to high inflation expectations. And so um, I, th I don't think that you can really say that China is, is emblematic or China is okay. representative of the rest of the, of the region. Klaus, thanks so much for joining us. Klaus Bader, Global Chief Economist at Societe Generale, thank you uh, very much. I just uh, wanted to draw your attention to a red headline across the Bloomberg uh, that tells us that the EU regulator is now recommending J&J &J as a booster after at least two months. So this just adding to the, uh, the, the booster arsenal, I suppose, that the European Union has to play with. We just heard a little bit earlier on from Ursula von der Leyen of the European Commission about her concerns around Omicron, that variant, in Europe in January. We have a lot of lockdown uh, measures not as severe as 2020, but a lot in place already in Europe, which may be dulling the growth of Omicron in the short term, but she was clearly concerned about that in the future. So that is a, a new headline on J&J. &J. Now stay with Bloomberg for our special coverage of the Fed decision and news conference with Jerome Powell. We were just discussing that, of course, with uh, Klaus Bader. It starts at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, former Federal Reserve Vice Chair Alan Blinder giving his thoughts on the Fed. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Caroline Hyde in London. Matt Miller with us in Berlin. Boris Johnson suffered his biggest rebellion since becoming UK Prime Minister. He has for was forced to rely on opposition votes to implement a key measure to stop the spread of the Omicron variant. Let's get more now with Bloomberg's David Merritt, who's with us. David, it was really uh, interesting to see the extent to which Boris Johnson then had to rely on the opposition to get his, his new COVID-fighting measures through Parliament. What does this tell us bigger picture about about the types of policy we might get over the winter will it make him think twice before trying to bring in any further restrictions well yes Anna. i mean it's certainly a, re a remarkable defeat the biggest one um certainly of his premiership and of many premierships before that is highly unusual for so many of the government's own mps to vote against him but of course they were sort of given a bit of cover weren't they by labor uh, ensuring that the message were going to pass there was no danger that any of these measures were not going to go through so they could sort of express their displeasure without actually derailing the anti-COVID measures. But yes, the big test is going to come in the coming months. You know, we're all looking at the numbers, aren't we? The rapidly increasing infection rates of, of Omicron, uh, exponential growth warnings from the health service about when and where they might become overwhelmed. So the expe expectation has got to be that there's going to have to be a little bit more action from the government, more restrictions put in, possibly after Christmas and into the new year. And what will the government be able to get through then? And will that rebellion get even bigger? That could be set against the backdrop of, you know, um, rising hospitalizations, uh, potentially rising death rates. And that's when things could get incredibly difficult for this government. Because if, if the government of the day cannot pass measures in an emergency, such as we're in now, um, because of their own side, then you've got to question uh, whether they are able to govern at all. And David got a question, you know, the actions of the past, because, I mean, even companies are weighing in here. Ryanair, you know, poking fun at really what the levels of change in terms of COVID anxiety mean for parties being held over at, well, the, with prime ministers involved. What does that mean for his authority? Is there going to be a leadership challenge? 
Well, this is the big problem, isn't it? Because, of course, we've had all of these headlines over the last few weeks about the rule breaking in the Conservative Party. The photograph in the, in the mirror this morning, Sean Bailey, he was the Conservative Party's candidate for mayor of London, standing in a big group of people, someone lying on the floor with a glass of wine, a full buffet. I mean, these images are very, very damaging. And when you talk to people, friends and colleagues and anyone out, side, they are saying, well, why should I pay any attention to what the government is telling me to do? Because they didn't follow their own rules this time last year. So there's a fundamental question here about the government's authority being undermined. Um, therefore, if no one's listening anymore, does there need to be a change at the top? I do think it's unlikely we're going to see a leadership challenge in the next few weeks. Parliament will be going home for Christmas uh, very soon. There'll mm. be a sort of natural fire break there, if you like. And really, who wants to throw their hat in the ring right now? Uh, to take over his leadership, uh, to take over the leadership. We are seeing, as I said, those numbers of infection surging again. We're going to have a very difficult few weeks um, with the National Health Service, with this resurgence of the pandemic into January and February. But yeah. perhaps as we emerge into the spring, what will the wreckage look like? Will someone else then want to step up and sort of reassert their authority over the Conservative Party? That will probably I mean, be Boris frankly, I... biggest moment of danger. I, I couldn't imagine who would have wanted to do it after David Cameron or after Theresa May. It doesn't seem like the greatest role. Um, what is this doing to the economy, David? I mean, I was supposed to go to London this week, and my wife nixed that straight away. I, I, I assume that a lot of people are doing a lot less commerce. That's right. You know, uh, this should be peak season right now for things like Christmas parties, shopping. Um, anecdotally, we're hearing restaurant bookings a bit are collapsing. People are cancelling their plans. People are staying at home. They do not want to catch this new variant and have their Christmas uh, ruined. Christmas holidays and trips are on the line. But of course, the difference between now and last year is that last year people were told to stay at home. And of course, there was the furlough scheme to support people in work and to support businesses. That hasn't happened yet. And you're seeing increasing mm. calls from hospitality to say, look, you, you're telling people to stay away or to look after, you know, to minimize their contacts, but we need some financial support. So will the Treasury step forward? We know there's been eye-watering amounts spent to support the economy so far, but this is having a big economic impact. And if yeah. the, the unemployment rate isn't to start to tick up again, the government are going to have to step in with some more official support measures. Yeah, it does seem as if a lot of sectors that are really affected by this then, David, hospitality, aviation, calling this lockdowns by stealth and calling for further support, as we saw in March, April 2020 with the furlough scheme. David, thank you very much. Bloomberg's David Merritt with the latest on the UK political story. Coming up later today, former IMF chief economist and Harvard economics professor Ken Rogoff will be joining the Bloomberg team. That is at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. think back to March of 2020 and where we were. And I think of all of the intervention and steps that have been taken since then. And you've certainly seen the recovery coming out the back end. I think one of the biggest concerns in particular is you're seeing us go through a digital transformation and the acceleration of it is ensuring that everyone has the skills, the digital training and skills to thrive in this new economy. I don't think it's uh, the great resignation. I think it's the great reshuffle. And people are reflecting on what do they want and how do they want to work and how do they want to live their life. So I think for all of us thinking about what does that mean for our institutions, it is about evolving the way we, we, we work, the way we interact, the expectations that we have. Now as the Alphabet SVP and CFO Ruth Porat speaking with Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Catch the full interview tonight on Studio 1.0. Now, I, I know that Tom Keane is going to be spending a lot of time thinking about the Fed, but I'm sure he's going to be spending a lot of time thinking about tech stocks and how they respond. Good morning to you, Tom, to the Fed. Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, mm. uh, joins us. Uh, now, your reflections ahead of the Fed then, Tom. Well, we've got retail sales coming out at 8.30. We'll cover that. Michael McKee will be on top of that. And, Anna, we've got just a wonderful show shut up. Uh, show, I'm talking, Anna. It's just I can't get it out. 
We have a wonderful <laughs> show set up. And very importantly, David Constant will join from Goldman Sachs to reaffirm the bull market. Let's look at the bull market. And it's made up of very few stocks. Five stocks have made up 51% of the gain since April. This goes back to what I call the Laidler Low, which is Christmas Eve 2018. S&P 500 still doing nicely. But the, the New York Stock Exchange Fang Index, which is 10 stocks, not five stocks, including dogs like Alibaba, really has outperformed. And it's a huge change, Anna, uh, over the two or three year period here, well over 100% out mm. growth by the tech names. Now, I'm not going to poo-poo David Costin, but to me, the most interesting calls out of Goldman Sachs come from Jan Hatzius. <clears throat> and the biggest worry, I think, is how much growth slows in the face of Fed hawkishness. What, what's, your, what's your feel on that, Tom? Well, they have different remits. Jan Hatzius is in charge of their economics, and that's looking at growth. And as we know, growth is so much sluggish, to say the least. In China, particularly, Costin is an equity guy looking <clears throat> at the stock market. Are they correlated? Most pros would tell you sometimes they are, Matt, and sometimes uh, they aren't. What's important here is the U.S. into the Fed meeting today has had a massive fiscal stimulus is a singular distinction. Tom, thank you very much. Sure. Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. We look forward to coverage of the Fed's decision later on today. Let's take a moment to think about what we're watching then in the day ahead. Matt, you go first. Well, because I am so excited about the Fed decision and the Fed decides which is the not-so-creatively-named special that Tom Keene and Jonathan Farrow will be anchoring this afternoon. I've got my eye, of course, on Jay Powell. I want to see um, if he's going to deliver what the market expects or if he even has the ability to surprise. Because with the CPI numbers at, I think, what, 6.8 and PPI at 9.7, and those inflation numbers don't look like they're going to turn lower anytime so soon, but rather higher, it'll be interesting to see what he can do about it. Caroline, what With about you? the balancing you? act thereof of the worries that growth will be hampered by Omicron, of course, by the COVID issue that is so pulling back the Bank of England in terms of its own hawkishness. Interesting, therefore, I'm going to be watching the corporate side to all of Omicron because the airline CEO is going to be testifying over in the US, a Senate panel. You're going to have the likes of Doug Parker of American Airlines. You're going to have Southwest, Gary Kelly, Scott Kirby of United Airlines, all of them in front of lawmakers trying to discuss well, the support they need amid, mm. once again, a hampering to us all getting back on a plane and the support they already take, Anna. Yeah, and it's interesting. There is actually a nice segment way into what I'm going to be watching, which is the Bloomberg Live Tech Summit. As a feature of that, I'm going to, I'm going to be uh, well, bringing you a conversation with the SAP CEO, Christian Klein. We'll talk about cloud computing, of course, the case for that really, really being made very strongly by the pandemic that we've all lived through, but also talking about business travel, the extent to which that's going to come back, which taps into oh, your point, Caroline, about when we are going to be getting back on those planes. And he'll also be talking about supply chains. This is a business that's really tapped in to some of those business networks and can give us uh, a really interesting insight. Do, they, the do, tech, do tech people now just wear t-shirts? Caroline, yesterday Mike Novogratz was wearing a hoodie, and I thought maybe for a second I saw an earring. We're seeing just t-shirts now? It, it's basically only you wearing a tie, Matt. You're the only piece of person yeah. I see all day who wears a tie. But just well done. Supporting the suit industry single-handedly. I mean, Romain and Tom Keane rock a good bow tie, too. That's true. Maybe that's where you need to go next, uh, Matt Miller. More Bloomberg surveillance is ahead. Uh, we'll hear from Dana Peterson of the Conference Board. This is Bloomberg.